name is Wendy Romney, and I'm a physical therapist and faculty member at Sacred Heart University. And I'm here today with Mary Claire Hemmer, who is a third year DPT student at Sacred Heart. And we're here today to talk to you about the optimal theory of motor learning. So MC, can you start us off? What is optimal? Sure, thanks Wendy. So, okay, so optimal theory is optimizing performance through intrinsic motivation and attention for learning. So this theory was proposed back in 2016 by Wolf and Lithwaite. Um, in order to implement findings from an accumulation of evidence that was suggesting that we have these motivational and attentional effects on performance and motor learning. So this theory highlights the social, cognitive, effective behavioral factors related to motor learning um, and supports the fact that we really have these fundamental psychological needs and motivational factors um, that increase our intrinsic motivation that need to be met in order to, to optimize motor learning. Um, so this graphic um, just kind of represents optimal theory. So starting from the left, we have our two overarching factors, which are motivation and attention. So with optimal, we want to um, really facilitate autonomy and enhanced expectancies um, for our patients when we're teaching them a, a movement and then facilitate an external focus of attention. And by doing this, um, we can really couple our actions to goals, which increases the patient's focus on the task goal and it decreases their focus um, on themselves. Um, and basically what the research, research has shown is that by kind of reducing that self-focus, we can actually improve motor performance and motor learning. Yeah, and when we think about it, if we provide explicit cues like pick up your foot, we're making the task more cognitive and involving the frontal and parietal lobes. So if we have implicit cues or an external focus, we know that the learning can take place without awareness, conscious awareness. And that goes with procedural learning and procedural memory. So studies with um, individuals with stroke with mild or moderate uh, impairments are less likely to be able to learn if we're providing a lot of internal cues. So uh, this external focus is, is great. So just to talk a little bit more about um, those, those three components we mentioned, autonomy, enhanced expectancies, and external focus. Um, so autonomy, um, with this, we really want to allow our patients control over some element of this task. So whether it's the practice environment um, or even something incidental to the task. So um, for example, there's a study um, on golfers, all with comparable skill levels, and one group was given white golf balls and the other group was given or was allowed to pick what color golf ball they used. Um, and so with the putting task, the group that could choose their color golf ball actually performed significantly better than the other group. Um, so that, that's really interesting, giving our patients a chance to um, choose something. Uh, for enhanced expectancies, um, this kind of is what it sounds like, just trying to improve our patients' ex expectations of how they're going to perform or how they're doing, um, increases their self-efficacy, increases their task interest, um, and just reduces their concerns about um, themselves. And then for an external focus, um, like Wendy had mentioned, we want to use um, instructions or analogies that direct attention away from oneself or their body parts and just focus on the, the goal of the movement. Um, so for example, there was one study cited in the um, original proposal where older adults did a balance task on a, like a wooden balance board. Um, one group was told to keep their feet horizontal and the other group was told to keep the markers on the board horizontal. And the group given the external cues um, did significantly better than the group with the internal cues. So MC, can you tell us about how we can relate it to PT? Absolutely. So, all right. So with autonomy, um, similar to the golf ball example, we can let patients choose the colors of cones or obstacles or maybe some other objects that we're using during a task. Um, and then also things related to what they're doing. So for example, if you have a patient riding the bike or walking on the treadmill, you could give them the option to increase the speed or increase the resistance or incline to make it more challenging. Um, asking them to let you know when, when they think they need some feedback rather than just providing it automatically. Um, or even asking what they think helped them yesterday with, with a task like the stairs um, and letting them have a chance to um, 
control what they're doing a little bit. And see, autonomy is kind of tricky too, though, right? Because sometimes um, we say to patients, what do you want to do today? And so what would be some factors that we could be aware of when you're thinking about it like that? Yeah, definitely. We don't want to, you know, hand over our total plan of care to the patient. <laughs> um, so I think um, one thing that really helps us is to give options. So kind of a, you know, if it doesn't make a difference to you as a therapist saying, you know, should we start with the stairs today or start with the treadmill? Um, or um, giving them again, options in terms of the colors, or do we want to do this in the gym or in the hallway? Um, just giving them options where you're okay with either answer. Um, yeah, and pre-planning too, right? Being aware of that option so you can be prepared to uh, to move forward with that for the treatment for the day, right? So for enhanced expectancies, um, something we can do here is just, you know, telling the patient how we think they're going to do. So saying, I think you'll be able to make it to the window, or I've seen people with your condition do this task before. Um, you can also use their previous performance. So yesterday you walked 50 feet. I know today you can do 60. Um, and same thing with timing. You know, yesterday you did this in 30 seconds, but I think today you can do it in under 25. Can you t give an example of some times where that could be bad and we just have to be careful about? Yeah, I mean, we definitely, we want to be careful, especially when we're setting objective goals, because we want to make sure it's something realistic that they can obtain. Um, and also keeping in mind, you know, people have bad days, so it doesn't always have to be setting a new record. It might just be setting something that's realistic for that day. Okay. So external cues. This is a tough one. <laughs> um, so just some, I, some examples of what I think we use commonly as PTs, um, nose over toes. That's like the infamous internal cue for doing sit to stands. Um, something you could actually do here to make it external is place some tape over um, the patient's feet on the floor and instruct them to stand up without breaking the tape. And if you try to if you try to do that, you'll realize you have to lean far enough forward in order for your feet to not come off the ground. Um, similarly, if you're saying push up with your arms, you could say push the chair into the ground. Um, take bigger steps or lift your foot all the way off the ground. So if people are having issues with foot clearance, you could say pretend that you're stepping over a puddle. Um, get rid of the noise coming from your shoe if their shoe is squeaking on the floor. Um, or even using visual cues like bean bags or cones or targets or something on the floor. And then another biggie in PT is posture. So um, instead of saying stand up tall or try to bring your hips forward, um, you could say imagine a string is pulling you up. Or um, Wendy and I had one patient who had significant forward trunk lean when he was walking on the treadmill. So we strapped a laser to his chest and put a target on the wall and told him to keep the laser on the target. So anytime he leaned forward, that laser would drop and he would have to correct himself. Yeah, you're right. I think that this is was the hardest. So MC and I were involved in a class last summer with um, 19 patients with stroke and incomplete spinal cord injury and Parkinson's disease. And when we decided to implement the optimal theory, we had to make like a purposeful attempt to get rid of our internal cues and start to use the external cues. So making a chart like this and holding each other accountable for um, changing our cueing techniques was, was the hardest part, I think, of the class. And I think we got there, but it's something we still struggle with. I still struggle with, I know. So Yeah, that was, that was definitely hard. It helped when you had patients who would, you know, make this kind of the same mistakes every day, then that's like, you know, where you can start planning ahead on how to cue them differently. So this study I just thought was interesting. Um, this was also by Wolf in 2018. He took 60 university students and divided them into four groups. Um, so three of the groups compared two out of the three um, factors, autonomy, enhanced expectancy, and external focus. And then one of the groups had all three combined. So the task was just throwing a ball to a target with their non-dominant arm um, for people receiving enhanced expectancies, they were told that however they scored was 20% above the average, um, even if that was fabricated. Um, for the external focus, they would be cued to focus on the target before every throw. And then for autonomy, they could choose a couple of throwing trials to throw with their dominant arm. 
Um, and what they found was um, at the end, the group that received all three components of optimal theory, theory performed significantly better than any of the other groups with just two out of the three. Um, so this just really reinforces that each of these components is really important um, rather than you know, just focusing on autonomy or external cues. Um, really the best thing we can do is try and hit all three. So how can we do that in PT? So in addition to some of the examples we just went over, um, predictions are a great way to hit all three at once. So maybe if you're first you know, starting to implement optimal theory, predictions are a good way um, to do that. So for example, if I'm asking a patient to predict how many steps can you do today, um, you're giving them autonomy because the patient is controlling the prediction enhanced expectancies because most likely the patient's going to set a goal for themselves that they think they can achieve. Um, and then external focus, they're not going to be worrying about what they look like on the stairs. They're just going to be climbing until they hit that goal. So thank you for helping me today to talk to um, the listeners about the optimal theory. And we'll, we're going to do a second session in a minute uh, talking about um, the patient, a patient example that we used this summer.